It's Monday, March 9th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, the telecommute. Let's do this. I was gonna ski this weekend. I, I was really looking forward to it. It was like cold and perfect all week. What are you talking about? Skiing is over. Uh, no, it's, it's not. Spring. Actually, no, it's not. You realize it's gonna snow here like tomorrow? Well, no, it's not. It's gonna get cold again. It's not gonna get that cold. Uh, yeah, it is. Maybe I'll have to pull up the NOAA. But anyway, <laughs> last week, early last week, it was freezing cold. It was perfect skiing weather. And the news was like, yep, it's gonna be cold all week. And then starting next week, it's gonna get warm for a little bit. I'm like, all right. And then every day, the forecast got a little bit warmer for the weekend. And then Saturday and Sunday, it was like 65 degrees. Wearing shorts. Ah. Uh. So while I wanted to ski, I couldn't really complain that much because I got to wear shorts. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you know, you, if you, you could ski even in that kind of weather if the mountain is high enough. Well, the thing is, depending on the weather and what was there before, you know, what came before... Skiing in, like, 50-degree weather in the right conditions is, like, the most fun you'll ever have because it's super comfortable and you're still skiing. Uh, yeah, I guess. But, you know, the thing is, if it's 50 degrees at the top of the mountain, the snow is all melting. Well, melting, but it depends on what kind of snow you got. I guess if you, like, you know, you if you can, um, can you, like, add salt to the snow? That makes it melt, you know, quicker, right? But, um... I don't know. I'm not a snow like, expert. If you had some sort of like reverse salt that you could add to the snow to sort of, uh, you know, like raise the freezing point, you know, so that maybe it, you know, stayed frozen at like 40 degrees or something. You know what I'm saying? Because you can add salt to make it, you know, melt at like, you know, lower than, you know, freezing. So couldn't you add reverse salt to do the opposite? Ah, uh, probably not. What's reverse salt, Scott? Some other chemical that, you know, has a, has a, it freezes a higher freezing point. I get. I don't know. But regardless, we had the crew out. Scientists, played, help me out here. Played some uh, burning Chemists. wheels, and then I, I was happy that we haven't had a good argument forever in the front row crew. Like you know, we're all atheists. Everyone kind of is generally you know liberal socially. And, like there's very little we disagree on in terms of the big issues. So finally, we, we had an argument. usually we have agreements. Uh, disagreements is when someone finds out something new that sort of contradicts what they already knew, right? So someone changes their mind and then starts to go and tell it to everyone else, and they'll be like, "Hey, that's not right." Nah, nah, nah. And then they sort of had to go and drag up all their evidence, and yep. then everyone goes, "Oh, the we, front we were all wrong." Is definitely a you know like in Burning Wheel when you make a character if you're. There's one question that basically says if you lived in like a difficult adversarial intellectual community as a child, plus one to your steel stat. That's kind of what it's like in the front row crew. If you if you so much as imply that you have an unbacked up statement that you're about to make, like everyone's ready to jump on you. Good. So we had we had a uh, a transhumanism argument, which is great because it's one of those things where. Other than historical trends, there's no evidence of what the future is going to be like. It's pretty much just, you know, extrapolation and assumption on both sides. And it all comes down to ethics and morals and, like, the fine distinctions. Mm -hmm. So that went on for, like, two hours. Scott missed it, which is good because, I, I guess, I think the last argument we had, you explained that you're the Ubermesh and thus you're beyond all of our trivial concerns. Yes, I am, which is, uh, I was so beyond your trivial concerns that I had no need to take part in your argument, because uh, I already knew the correct answer, and you're not worthy of hearing it from me. <laughs> so, uh, what is the correct news, Scott? The correct news is this. Um, so, in Sweden, the Pirate Bay, they're doing their business, right? I think that they finished up, but I don't think there's been a, a verdict yet. I think we're waiting for that still. Um, and if we're not still waiting for it, well, I, I haven't seen the result. And uh, so, someone please tell me what it is. But I'm pretty sure we're waiting for the result there. But one country away from Sweden, in Norway, right? The exact opposite is happening, <laughs> And basically, uh, Norway's public broadcaster, which I assume is the equivalent of like PBS in the United States, is taking their shows and they set up a BitTorrent tracker using the same exact software the Pirate Bay uses for their BitTorrent tracker and is uh, putting all their stuff up on BitTorrent. But 
Unlike, say, for instance, BBC's iPlayer, right, which doesn't let people outside of the UK um, watch all the you know free BBC stuff online, the Norway's BitTorrent tracker is completely DRM-free. It's completely open. It's just BitTorrent, right? And not only does that mean that you can, you know, subtitle, translate, whatever, they are actively trying to get people to fan sub their programs now and so you can send in the subtitle tracks and they'll add them in this is brilliant absolutely brilliant yeah and think i mean think about this right norway you know norway is cool and all but they're not exactly a big player in the world right but by making their public broadcasting freely available to the world i mean look at how popular bbc stuff is in the united states yeah they can project their culture you know, around the world far more strongly than, you know, someone who, like, keeps all their media, like, you know, closed and locked in. Well, especially with the signal-to-noise ratio is definitely increasing, and more and more good media, as my thing of the day is going to point out, is free. And it's free as in beer, it's free as in speech, it's just free, and you can just watch it. So the more barriers anyone puts in the way of getting media, be it paying, be it DRM, be it, you know, advertising anything— Every one of those barriers is, in the end, kind of making your media further away from people. Yeah, well, I mean, think about this, right? What, you know, if you thought about, um, you know, let's say it was the year 1995, right? And you tried to think of, like, you know, what really, you know, media things sort of define the culture and society. You'd think about, you know, Nintendo sorts of things, you know, in terms of us, right? You think about Ninja Turtles, maybe, maybe something Disney-ish. You know, Disney afternoon kind of thing. You know, that's that's the sort of stuff you would, uh, I, you know, where I would think about from those days, right? But um, you know, nowadays, what it's do you? Numa Numa. <laughs> it's a Numa Numa. It's a Numa Numa guy, right? It's and, and all the stuff that is paid for or DRM'd or locked in. I mean, sure, there's still a lot of people out there who are all over. You know, um, I mean, even us were like, you know, South Park and, and other things like that, right? But South but Park is free. Exactly. <laughs> None of the stuff that is like difficult to get at is uh, is making it out there. You know, even like just you know big movies that you have to pay like you know the Watchmen was it's getting pretty big, but you know what? It's not. It's not as that that big. You're saying Watchmen isn't as big as Numa Numa? I don't know. In the long run, it's... it's See, the thing uh, is, one thing we can't say... I think it's say, bigger than Numa Numa, specifically. What we can't say yet is that the Watchmen movie it is still, like, it's still coming out. Like Washington, it is still coming. <laughs> We're not sure how many people it's going to kick apart just yet. Mm. Because... It, it's. I mean, I see enough people who have no connection to comic books or who don't care about superheroes or anything, like, being into the Watchmen that... Watchmen might come out of nowhere to become... Well, because I think the one thing is that when something has high quality, it can sort of go over the barrier, right? So it's like you put up this barrier around your stuff. If your stuff is like a super strong, super high jumper, it's going to jump right over that wall, no problem, because it's that good. Well, that's one of the things that's great. It means that free media is there, and free media competes with other free media, and while free media competes with the walled-off media, you can make a much higher quality walled-off media thing just by the nature of the fact that... Well, you can make, a, you can make just as high quality thing that's uh, not walled-off. Uh, you're, point- you're saying you can make Watchmen with no barrier. It's completely free. There's no, uh, there's no possible way to make money off it. It's just there. You could have made that. Well, the comic book. You're assuming that uh, if you're talking about the movie, you're assuming that higher production value and cost equals better. <laughs> No, I'm saying that what if you commercial media, media that is made with a barrier, with the intention of using that barrier to entry to make money. Not all, but the other thing is the barrier really has nothing to do with being commercial or not. There's plenty of non-commercial things that have barriers. Well, like Dwarf Fortress. Exactly. But I, I'm talking specifically about commercial media, that specific kind of barrier, the toll of paying money or watching ads to see it. Mm. it the quality that something has to be becomes much higher to get the current generation of kids and people, especially kids and the generations coming, 
to bother with it at all. So I think we're going to see this like distillation of commercial media. And at the same time, we're going to see this flourishing of free media. I think we have already seen a distillation of, uh, you know, the commercial media. Cause basically, you know, it's like the stuff that people actually really care about and really like, they're sort of going out of their way to get it and everything else is being completely ignored. Yep. But look at, and I'm talking about in terms of media production too. I mean, media is splitting between, Game show slash reality TV that costs nothing to make. So as a result, you can make a lot of money off it, even though there's a barrier, you know, lowest common denominator and all that. And then the really high quality, like the HBO stuff where like Dexter, where there is a barrier to entry, but it's good enough in most people's minds that that barrier is so worth it. That you're like, there's the, the gap between the crappy media with the lowest common denominator and low production values and the high quality, high production value costing it in. Just, just commercial media is widening. And then the free media is like this whole third pillar. I'm just looking forward to uh, experiencing some Norwegian television. Uh, I am as well, because if nothing else, Scandinavian, Norway, all that whole area... Their folklore and their folk tales kick the shit out of American folk. What do we have? We have Paul oh, Bunyan. Are you sure that folk tales are what's going to be on their public broadcasting? No, but I mean, think about it. There is a lot of media in America that's based on like Americana or American culture or American like idioms or, you know, the old cartoons about Johnny Appleseed and Paul Bunyan. I want to see the equivalent of that from Finland and Sweden and Norway. It's all about fish. <laughs> So uh, I don't want to talk a lot about this, but uh, as you all know, Circuit City is gone now. The final days happened. And yep, you can't. If you were hoping to buy stuff at a bargain, too late. <laughs> I went to the Circuit City on like Fifth Avenue on the third to last day. And let me tell you, it was a sad sight. What was left was basically like broken store models of things that were like 80% off, broken fixtures. Like there were people buying like hooks off of shelves for 10 cents each i, I would have taken hooks yeah they weren't the kind of hooks we can use unless you were also buying those shelves you happen to own those kinds of shelves they weren't uh they were pieces of metal basically i mean i guess you could buy one i mean if i were a mugger i could have bought some pretty good mugging implements in there for real cheap yeah the fixtures are always the best things to buy because you know you can if you have like space in a house you can set those things up and it's pretty nice you get like a, a good spinner rack those are worth it uh, but uh, the thing is, there was nothing left at all. Except, Wait, couldn't you buy except, like, a, can you buy like a four megabyte SD card for like twenty five cents? No, because those were all gone. Even the four megabyte ones. There was nothing I, left except the I fixtures. Were you listening? Like the four megabyte, like Scott, so small that it's worthless. They weren't there. There was nothing left. There were a couple of broken store models of things. There were like two couches, real cheap, but I was on my own, and it would have cost me more to ship the stupid thing back up here than you know, it wasn't worth it. But couches. Yeah, like leather couches. They had couches? Yeah. Wow. What about the car stereo section? Uh, empty. Oh, wow. Even but, it but in the back where the CDs are, there were th like thousands of CDs. I wouldn't, don't, the, wouldn't the CDs get like discounted so much they just clean out? Because, I mean, I don't need to buy a CD. But if a CD is like a dollar or 50 cent, I'll buy it and take it to the secondhand music store or sell it on Amazon or something. There were a ton of CDs. and I, I could have quit my job, bought all the CDs for 50 cents each, and then sold them all on Amazon. You know Amazon why they weren't and... selling? They were not discounted that much. They were 5 to $15. <laughs> the things don't sell at Best Buy when they're not discounted. So why would they sell it at, in a going out of business sale if they're not discounted? My suspicion. Now, I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly what the deal was, but... My bet is that the rule, there was some sort of rule where they weren't allowed to discount the CDs below a certain amount. Because you've seen that before. There, there's a, there are a lot of things like that. Like, you can't sell Apple stuff below yeah, a certain they were, amount. Yeah, I bet the iPods weren't discounted at all. Those were gone. I think they, they shipped those somewhere else. But <laughs> yeah. I don't, maybe they weren't allowed to discount the CDs. I don't know. But no one was even looking at them either. I wonder if you bought a car stereo, like, at the clearance, would, you still, would they still do an installation? <laughs> Uh, would you want the guy working in Circuit City and the last day to install something in your car? Maybe he'd be so passionate about it. He was like, he was a hardcore dude. Actually, there was this good picture. Uh, I found it somewhere on the internet. I'd link to it, but I don't remember where I saw it. It was one of those Circuit City signs at a Circuit City, and it was like, car stereo, 80% off, TVs, 40% off, dignity, 0.2% off. Oh. <laughs> I was proud of that. But no, my real news. So... Apple and the iPod and the iPhone 
the iPhone's a closed platform and you've got to like, you know, go through all this rigmarole to sell your stuff in the Apple store and they can say what goes in and what doesn't and all that stuff. And you all know that. Apparently, so many people are developing or trying to develop for the App Store that Apple is just completely dropping the ball now. Like, if you request the right to use it, it might take months or you might just never get an answer. And they like, if you call them, they have no idea what you're talking about. People's contracts are like mm. expiring apparently. And they try to renew them and like no one answers their phone and no one tells them what to do. And like, it's really falling apart on the developer side. This is, this is really interesting because I don't, I don't think we've actually, I can't remember an instance where this happened, where someone would try to keep something closed. Right. And in keeping something closed and limited, you need a bureaucracy to sort of manage, you know, everything. And if the bureaucracy can't keep up with the demand, you know, everything just sort of collapses. And it's it's real interesting to sort of be like, huh, ah, at least they're sort of having to, you know, sure, they're dicking all of us by keeping it closed, but they're paying for it. It's costing them to keep it closed, which makes you think, you know, even if they would perhaps, you know, lose whatever they would lose, perhaps, you know, for having apps they don't like or, you know, whatever else, right? Maybe they would actually make more money if they kept it open and got rid of all that bureaucracy in the way. Well, what's interesting to me is that, that you know, there, there are many reasons you could have a closed platform. And one idea that, or at least a special restricted thing, like say they had the, the everything goes app store and then they had the Apple certified app store. They like check your app out and make sure it's not crap. Yeah, that'd be fun. But uh, looking through what's available on the app store, like 99% of it is garbage. Well, I mean, we talked about, we didn't, I don't think we did talk about No, this. we didn't. We that were, news we, that... we were, it was like the one news we missed, right? It's basically, someone did, it was like, a, there's an ad, I think it was an advertiser who does iPhone ads. And in, because they're doing iPhone ads, they have all this information about iPhone uh, apps, right? Because the ads are in the apps. And they sort of found out what everyone already knew, which is that, People like to install apps, but they install them, use them once, and then usually never use them again. And they pretty much only use a few apps very frequently. You know, I mean, I have an iPhone, right? I use the iPod app, the phone app, the Safari, the mail. I use those the most, and those are built in. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, there's very few stuff that does not built in that I actually use a lot, you know? And so what I did is I saw that news, and I was like, yeah, that news is exactly right. And I'm like, well, I'll just go through here and delete all these apps that I never use. And I, I deleted a whole mess of them. And it, you know, cleaned up my phone a whole lot. Well, I, I think there's going to be a big kind of day of reckoning with the App Store. Because the iPhone, like, had this big surge. Everyone got one. And then, what? It's the same thing when you get, like, a Vista, Vista PC. And you have that little uh, bar on the side for widgets. And you look at, like, all the widgets. You're like, could I use that? Could I use that? That's cool. That's cool. And you put, like, ten in there. And then a week later, you get rid of nine of them. Yep. If you even bought the thing is some people don't bother. Like they put all the widgets there and then they just don't look at them. Yeah. Don't think about them. But it just, it, I feel, I don't know, but I feel like. So people love setting up widgets, but people don't actually use them. It's like the Mac dashboard. Same thing. But I wonder what Apple nominally part of this was that they only want good stuff to be in the, in the uh, store, but yet most of the stuff in the store is overpriced garbage. And now, so many people want to develop, but more and more they seem to deny the apps that people really, really want, like uh, syncing podcasts just over the air without any trouble, or yep. Adblock. Yep, it's kind of it's kind of crazy. Um, I don't know. I think the real problem there's another problem. I think people don't recognize a whole bunch is that you know the App Store itself has a really bad user interface. It's really, I mean, there's, you know, thousands and thousands of apps, right? Well, how can you look at these apps? You can look at the top apps in any given category, right? You know, whatever they, however they determine that, right? I guess based on recent popularity. Um, you can look at paid or free separately, and you can search if you know the name of an app, right? And that you can, you know, so... The thing is, there's a lot of, there's probably good apps that are hidden way down there where no one can find them. And there's crap apps coming up to the top. And, I mean, I guess you can, like, browse all the apps in a given category in alphabetical order going, like, next page, next page, next page. <laughs> but it's, like, it's really, really difficult to, uh, you know, to, like, find anything in there, you know. And to, you know, maybe there's something in there that's going to change your life and you're actually going to use it every day. Good luck finding it. You're, you're never going to come across that. 
you know, and even apps that were like pretty popular, like maybe like uh, like a few weeks ago. Now they're like they're just as hidden as like all the crap at the bottom. So if you, uh, you know, buy an iPhone like today, you're not going to find out like Tetris, which came out, you know, uh, like when the iPhone came out, it's totally hidden. In well, the app I'm store sure now. people who want Tetris search for the word well, Tetris. Yes. If you want Tetris, you search for it. But like if you don't, you know, th- there's other stuff that if you want, but at you're never going to think at the same time. It. Isn't the point that p- when people go out looking for something to install, as opposed to looking for a specific thing, they'll install crap that they don't actually use. That's exactly correct. You know, you shouldn't. You know, there's so many people that are like, hey, are there any cool apps? It's like. Dude, don't think like that. You should think if when you know, don't install anything. And then if you need something, then search for what you need as you need it, right? That's the way to go about things. However, right? There are occasions which there is something you need, but you just don't know you need it. And that that situation does exist, and that's that can't be fulfilled unless You have some sort of way for things that people need, but they don't know they need or sort of put in front of their face every once in a while, you know, and uh, the app store sort of fails at that. And I think it's actually costing a lot of uh, developers, you know, revenues. It's like you're making a lot of money in the app store. You could be making a lot more if people could actually, you know, see your app at some time. My only hope is that the the fact that more and more the crap apps are not selling as well, at least as far as I could tell based on that article. I mean, maybe things will change if there's another surge yeah. of iPhone users. But Apple's going to have to change something if they want this platform to succeed. Because while the Android is not an optimal solution either, if things continue the way they are, I feel like the open platform is going to win out in the end just for the fact yeah. that the open platform is going to have a browser with ad block in it and over the air podcast now, syncing. And I really think that, you know, the, the Palm is going to have trouble because it's coming out on Sprint and it's coming out at sort of a blah time. But if it wasn't coming out on Sprint, I would, I'd be all about that. I think that if the Palm at Pre is all it's cracked up to be, that in the, in the, you know, mid to longer term, it's going to just, it's just going to hose everything because. People are still familiar with Palm, you know, they, they still, you know, they were all Trio users before they were BlackBerry users, you know, they were, that's what they were doing. And, it, you know, it's all web-based and, you know, there's web developers, you know, it's way easier and there's way more of them than there are, you know, uh, people who can make freaking Objective-C iPhone apps, right? So it's it's really got a strong potential to, to just blow everything else out and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be real interesting. Of course, Sprint. And I, I left Sprint a long time ago for the equally bad Verizon. Yeah. Well, Verizon's a little better in some ways, but yeah. it's also worse in some ways. I mean, Sprint <sighs> is like, you know, it really has the best pricing and plans. I mean, they had that $100 for unlimited everything plan, which is, I guess, it's all right, you know. But uh, their network, you know, I guess it's supposedly the fastest data network, but Verizon, at least where we live, has the strongest coverage. You know, wherever you go, you're going to get some bars. I mean, I got the AT&T, and over here, I don't get all these bars. But anyway, time for things of the day. Now, we're talking all about free culture and free media, and the thing, like, the iconic kind of media of the modern internet generation is the mashup. The creative, you know, people always said, yeah, the creative commons is great, but... Like, what can you really create that when you're just deriving or making derivative works of stuff that other people have made? Too bad everything is derivative. Well, but I mean, even the, cave painting is derivative. But there are different degrees of derivative. There's a difference between writing like a relatively new story or a new take on the story versus writing Bamlet. Bamlet? <laughs> What's Bamlet? Bamlet is about a man named Bamlet whose father is murdered by his uncle. So it's exactly the same as Hamlet, only you changed one See, letter. There are degrees of derivation. <laughs> now, the key th- is to make integrated works. <laughs> but anyway, I remember way back when like, pe- Creative Commons licenses were starting to be used more and more, and people would argue that if you're just taking, like, what's the point of having these share alike licenses? Who's going to take Geek Nights and remix it into techno or crap like that? Well, if you've never gotten how good a mashup can be, check out this video. This is just a mashup of like YouTube videos of people playing instruments and they make a song that is better than a lot of commercial music out there that I've paid money for. Yeah. It, it, it just, it's fantastic. And the visuals, it, 
I really like this. This like mm-hmm. this is fa- this is great, and I don't know what else I can say about it except that it's great. It's pretty great. I just want to clarify one thing: is that the share a- the share alike clause on the Creative Commons licenses specifically has it has many uses, but one specific use it has is it prevents people from DRMing your shit. So like, if we put out an episode of Geek Nights, if we have a share alike on there, then you could take Geek Nights and give it to your friends, but you could not take Geek Nights and put a DRM on it and then put it on your website. You couldn't do that. And if you like remixed Geek Nights, you couldn't put DRM on that either. Yep. So that's that's one thing the share alike does. That's that's a reason to have it if you don't want people to DRM your stuff. Of course, that's also one thing that you know there are a lot of different sides to the copyright argument, but people don't. You can't forget that if you want things like the Creative Commons license and all these sorts of ways of protecting your work or determining, you know, giving your work away with certain restrictions, the Creative Commons and all these things rely entirely on copyright law. You can't just get rid of copyright law because then you also get rid of all these sorts of free share with other people. Well, basically, you know, since... The what it what the Creative Commons shows, right, is that copyright law is insane, right? It basically means all rights reserved by default. So Creative Commons comes in and says, All right, well you know what? All rights are reserved by default. I will explicitly only reserve the rights that should be the only ones that are reserved by law. So basically you're you're getting rid of your you're basically getting rid of a bunch of rights so that it's the way it should be. I'm know? I'm of the mind that the the only right you probably shouldn't be able to give up from a copyright or anything, any you know, creative work you've created are moral rights. But I figure everything else, you should be able to give it up. You should be able to just creative commons, free, whatever. But you know what? All that aside, this this is pretty rocking, and I, I highly recommend you check it out. Yep. All right, so lately, past you know, week or so, I've been uh, not shit-talking. I've been doing things, right? And... Um, I was, you know, there's a lot of that kind of, you know, do stuff crap all over the internet, you know, like to-do lists and the getting things done and all that kind of crap, right? But I came across this one, and this one I think is uh, is actually pretty nice. You know, it, don't take this too seriously. It's just kind of, I just want to toss this out there. This is the Cult of Done Manifesto. Uh-huh. And there are, there are, uh, I'm going to read, I'm going to read to you this manifesto, right? Uh, give me a second. Okay. Number one. There are three stages of being, not knowing, action, and completion. (laughs) Two, (laughs) except that everything is a draft. It helps to get it done. (laughs) Three, there is no editing stage. Four, pretending you know what you're doing is almost the same as knowing what you're doing. So just accept that you know what you're doing even if you don't and do it. Five, banish procrastination. If you wait more than a week to get an idea done, abandon it. I got that one, right? (laughs) Six, the point of being done is not to finish, but to get other things done. Seven, once you're done, you can throw it away. Eight, laugh at perfection. It's boring and keeps you from being done. (laughs) Nine, people without dirty hands are wrong. Doing something (laughs) makes you right. I like that one a lot. Yeah, it's like people without dirty hands are wrong. Doing something makes you right. I could talk for ten minutes just about that item. That feels a lot like one of the one of the like st- like a statement that would be in Burning Wheel. You know I what? Don't know. Well, well, here let, let's talk about it at least a little bit that particular item, right? So, whenever you're like in you know having an argument with someone, right? You know, let's say you're arguing with you someone. can't lift ten Pokemon. I lift ten Pokemon. Well. That's well, no, it. <laughs> not even that, but it's like, you know, let's say you're, t- you're discussing, I don't know, like, you know, healthcare or something like that. It's like, it's like, well, I worked in a hospital or, you know, I, well, I'm a doctor, you know, I did that. That is like that, that adds more, you know, it, it really doesn't add that much weight because I can demonstrate lots of people who do things yet know nothing about the thing they do, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, other tech people, but, um, you know, it, it, it really it really helps you out, in an, it, especially arguing with people. Anyway, 10, failure counts as done, so do mistakes. 11, destruction is a variant of done. 12, <laughs> if you have an idea and publish it on the internet, that counts as a ghost of done. <laughs> 13, done is the engine of more. So uh, I kind of I like this. So they do stuff? Yes, you want to be done. Don't worry about making mistakes. Don't worry about perfection. You just well, think fucking about, think about do. what this. It's like the nano remote. You know, just just write your novel. You can fix it later, whatever. But just write it. Yeah, everything is a draft. Just fucking do, 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 do. Don't you know? Slow down. Don't waste your time. 
You know, don't, you know, I guess you can write about your idea on the internet first, but that's just a ghost. You actually have to do it. Well, you know, Neil Gaiman even said, you know, he always, he said that thing about how an idea is worth nothing because the implementation of an idea is the only thing that matters. Everyone has ideas, but no one acts on them. Yep. And also, it's either, it's either do or do do. And also being able to act on them well. I mean, you know, any schmuck can come up with the idea for like the best novel ever. Can that schmuck actually write that best novel? No. So, you know, Neil Gaiman has, he was basically that quote was when people were, you know, submitting ideas for novels to him. And he's basically like, look, your ideas are worth nothing. There's a million ideas. I'm the one who has the rare and valuable skill of being able to turn your idea into a best selling book. Therefore, your idea is worth nothing. If you give me an idea and I turn it into a book, you get nothing. I get millions of dollars because <laughs> your idea is worthless. Ideas are cheap and everyone has a million of them. So we're not going to talk about this too long. This is one of those like overview shows where we'll think of all the shows we might want to do about it in the future. But I was it's one of those shows we didn't have we couldn't come up with something. It's the last minute. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's also it's on my mind lately because I, one of the projects I actually was just put at the head of at work is that. You know, we're a financial firm and we have to have like disaster recovery. Like if New York City didn't exist tomorrow, we have to just come online and be doing business tomorrow like nothing happened. So as a result, we have disaster recovery. Like we have the ability to funk like every business process we have has a complete backup in some other place. And that that like disaster recovery alone, like we could do God, we could do months and months and months and shows of how to do disaster recovery. That's like one of the biggest IT CS things out there, but we're not talking about disaster recovery. Mm -hmm. But the project I'm heading up is this really small thing, and the idea is that we're trying to test how well our disaster recovery works in a real-world situation. And we figured out the best way to do this is to have everyone important at the company work from home one day a month and try to do their entire job from home. And... Because I'm in charge of this, it means I'm going to be able to telecommute a little bit as I test all these different things. And you know what? I hate you. Telecommuting is the holy goddamn grail of tech workers. It is like we want nothing more than to be able to work from home. Because as Scott can tell you, as I, I can would just tell go you, just buy a cheap, gigantic house in the middle of fuck nowhere where there's internet. Like on the, the farthest away I could be and still get internets. And you know what? I'd try to make the company pay for that internet and get like a T1 to the house. Because... In, for, especially for CS people like Scott, like people who are writing code, you don't need to be anywhere. People give you requirements and code comes out. Yeah, I mean, you know, I get requests sometimes. So if you could just call me on the phone. I mean, there's no, I don't, there's no real reason I need to physically be there. And I'm so excited about this because I'm going to get to work from home at least once a month to start. And then we'll see where this goes. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, the thing about working from home, right, technologically speaking, right, is you you have this person who, who does work, and most of their work, the vast majority of it, is computer-related, right? Some of it will be telephone work. Some of it might even be paper work. But it, most of it is computer work. And that means you need to somehow get their computer in their house on their normal, mundane consumer internet onto the business network as so that it is as if they are sitting at their desk at work and technologically speaking that is not very easy to do and it is much more difficult to do securely <laughs> than uh, it is to do at all but uh, technologically like we're at a point where it's never been easier to work from home at least for tech workers well most tech workers i mean like if you're say you're doing like support like you answer the phones there's really no reason for you to be in an office if all you do is answer phones and take support calls. The reason is so someone keep keep an eye on you. Well, that's the problem. The fundamental thing that's holding back the like work from home revolution. And I say revolution not lightly because I feel like in a lot of ways it would be a major societal revolution. Yeah. Well, I, I if, think that if people who don't need to physically commute could work from home and it, we'd kind of come mm -hmm. back to it's like we go back to cottage industry but it's not really cottage industry. It's just you're doing, you know, modern integrated work, but you're doing it remotely. Yeah. I mean, and people talk about like, oh, if we only had mass transit, right? What what if just no one had to get in their car at all? That'd Think be, about it. Tele I mean, that'd uh, be even better. We wouldn't, you know, the, telecommuting the is teleporting. 
Yeah. You teleport to work, you teleport home, and you can make your own sandwich from your own fridge. Yep. It's definitely, I think, you know, definitely a, a, a way to go. Nope, the I thing think- is, is that I think there's just a lot of jobs. You know, there's plenty of telecommuters out there, right? These people do exist. There's plenty of them. But I think that there are a, a huge number of jobs that could be telecommuting and just aren't. Now, at the same time, there are definitely... Mostly cubicle people. There are, there are a lot of jobs that can't really... You can't telecommute. And even jobs that seem like you could telecommute, if you actually telecommuted full-time, it would probably break down, if for nothing else, than that there is a certain power to presence and to getting yep. together. And I well, feel you like... Know, I get together once a week, you know, get yeah. together when there's a meeting, but when there's not a meeting, you don't have to be here. Well, the interesting thing is that more technological people and younger generations who are used to this, I think are more and more able to get stuff done without having to meet in person. Mm -hmm. I mean, like all the younger tech people at my, like where I work right now, we use the internal company I am all the time. Like my my boss will say, hey, call so-and-so and and sort out this thing. And I'll just be typing. And then he's like, hey, did you call so-and-so yet? And I'm like, yeah, we already worked it out and I am. Yeah. Well, here, think about this scenario, right? Here's a here's an example of a job that can't telecommute, right? The desktop support guy. Sometimes he's got to go plug in a monitor. Sometimes he's got to go switch a video card, right? That guy needs to be there, right? Yep. But what if everyone else is telecommuting? Well, then you don't need that guy, right? Because there's no desktops in the office. But then you have desktops at home. You have desktops at home. So how do you get this guy to go to everyone's house, which is all over the place, if they need desktop support at their house? Now, the, the answer is... If you're working with technological people, you don't. Because you don't, the because they can people. take care of themselves. But what if you send, like, all your phone salespeople home to telecommute? And then you, you give them all laptops, right? What happens if those laptops actually break hardware-wise? They got to mail it back. You mail them a new one. With, well, you know, you know what? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you start, those are the kind of problems that will sort of come out at you. Yep, and they're all solvable. Oh, but, they, they are, but they're not They're not optimal, you know. Well, it's, some are. It really depends. There's always a trade-off somewhere. I guess I feel like right now, like as of today, March 9th, you know, 2009, oh my God, it's almost 2010. Yep. The 90s were like 20 years ago. Well, the early 90s. Yep. Oh, my God. Anyway, I'm just suddenly feeling really old You're because old. I think back to 1990 and it feels like it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> it was a long but time. then I think about what the world was like in 1990. You were eight. I was eight. eight. There weren't cell phones. Nope. <laughs> anyway, there weren't even Super Nintendos. Oh, my God. Oh, maybe there were. Maybe it was it was close. Eight, nine. I, did, I don't think there were Super Nintendo. Anyway, I'm not going to look that up. But I feel like right now. Telecommuting for highly skilled technological people who don't need to physically work on physical bits not only is possible and perhaps trivial, but should be encouraged. However, I feel like the best way to go about it, absolutely, is that say like you're in a position like me, like you do primarily like support and computer work and everything you do is like with a computer and you don't really have to physically interact with anything just with people. What if you just telecommute every Friday or every Thursday or once a week? So you're still in the office getting all that interaction and you're still getting out of the house. You don't turn into like a hikikomori. I mean, I've known people who like telecommuted and they like stop going outside. Yeah, that's, they stop getting dressed. That's definitely a problem that can happen. And it's know? purely a psychological thing. But I mean, like if I if I when I telecommute now, like I've done it once or twice. But if if I'm staying at home, like I'll still like get up and shower and shave and like get dressed. But if I was telecommuting every day, I would probably start waking up later and later, and I'd probably just stop shaving, and I'd probably stop getting out of my... Like, I'd wake up and put on clean pajamas, and then move I'd over to my I'd only shower desk. when I actually felt nasty, you know? That's and, the- that, and then you start to, I don't know, you start to blur the work-life boundary, unless you're really disciplined. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know what to do about that. Yeah, well, I think the best way, and I feel like... Anyone who's a highly skilled technical worker should lobby for telecommuting if you, if you think your job can get away with it. And I think the way to sell it is to offer to do it one day a month and even offer to make it not be Mondays or Fridays. Yeah, and that way you could just, you know, you'd be able to just, in those days, you would, like, work extra hard and you would even, you know, like work from the time your commute would steer regular commute would start to the time you would get home right 
and then it's you know that way you're not you're working actually more time but you're you know away from you know quote away from home for more time right uh for the same amount of time and you're sort of demonstrating to them like look i'm do you're getting just as much out of me here as there if not more so there's no there's no reason to make me come into the office and in fact you know, if you let me move farther away, I can get a bigger house for less money, you know, in this bad real estate market. You'll you'll get even, you know, more work for the same amount of money, and I'll get more for my money, and it works out for everybody. Well, plus, I feel like even if you just, like, say you did it once a month, like one day a month is your telecommuting day. It's not a vacation day. Like, you still have to work, and you're still going to get stuff done. But I feel like, and it's been my experience with other, like, working places where other people telecommuted, People who have even like that little telecommute, like once a month, are a thousand times happier at their jobs. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, how many? I mean, you're all a lot of you are tech people are going into tech. How many of you are like sitting at work for like an hour at the end of a day where you have no more work to do, or you're just like your brain's fried? You're not going to get anything else done, but. You can't just leave. You have to stay there and, like, mm. pretend to work for another couple hours. Well, I think, you know, telecommuting really in that sense is not so much different from, you know, the flex time thing, right? And it goes back into the why do so many employers feel the need to sort of force you to be there from X hour to X hour? Should they not instead just force you to get X work done by X deadline and yes. not care how many hours you're in the office? And what telecommuting does is it sort of circumvents the employer who demands certain hours and instead you know allows you to have flex time even if you don't have it because if you're at home you know if you're at work and you only have five hours of work but you have to sit there for eight hours that's three hours where you're going duh right and if you have a flex time you can just leave three hours early but if you're at home you know you're basically you can work your five hours you get all the same amount of work done throughout the day and you'll just three hours during the day sometime you'll just be doing something else at home you'll actually be you know you'll be able to do your laundry or something whereas if you're at work those three hours all you can really do is read slash dot or play solitaire or, yep. or some play a flash game <laughs> you can't but, do anything and i just i feel like it makes people happier and i'd get more work done and i, I really it still depends on the job like part depends of the, on the person you, too yes, i mean part of the reason you work you know the eight hour schedule is depending on are they keeping you there because they don't know better or because, you know, that's the the hours everyone works and they just expect it? Or are they keeping you there not because, like, you might not have enough work to do, but they're paying you the money they're paying you because they're you're available for when they need you. Yeah, it's like, you know, for example, at my work, right, I could be sitting there for, like, three hours, but then, like, at 4.30, they'll be like... I need you to do this thing like right now, you know, yep. it could ha at any time they could just be like, oh, someone could need something from me. Or like you know? me, the stock market is open from 930 to four. They're paying me to be there from 930 to four to make sure stuff doesn't catch on fire while the stock market's open. I can't like flex time that I can't be like, yeah, I only have two hours of support work to do. So I'll do it on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about some of the telecommute technologies? I think we should because I have it because I'm actually I'm on support this week. Like I'm the go to guy. So mm -hmm. right now, like, you know, my desk, I have this gigantic desk in my in like in the Geek Night studio. Which it's is not gigantic. Also it's a normal size desk. It's it's pretty gigantic. It's not even as big as my desk at work. Well, you have an unnecessarily large desk at work because they fired everybody. What do you want from me? <laughs> I had this, I had an even larger desk before they fired everyone. My desk at work before they fired everyone had a mini fridge on it. What's even scarier is that when I worked at IBM, I had an office just because there were extra offices. Wow. And you have to be a certain like band level. Like there's rules. Like you have to be level eight to get a shared office oh, with a door that closes. That shit. But if you're level nine, you're allowed to have an office to yourself. And we kind of got around all that because we we're in this like if I went like we're on the third floor, right? The second floor was identical. Sometimes I'd get off on the second floor by accident off the elevator and I'd walk over to my office and that whole floor was like empty. Uh. So I'd go to like this empty office and I'd be like, Oh wait, and I'd go back and go up a floor. <laughs> it was kind of cool. Yeah, but anyway, so the first thing, right, is uh, I mean, Blackberries. I don't know if we should consider, you know, like cell phones and things part of telecommuting. That's not work from home. That's your available. That's a different yeah. thing. So I mean, the first thing, right, is you need like the full on work telephone, and you know, the 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 cell phone really doesn't suffice. You know, you need to be able to like 
you know, pick up on, you know, multiple lines. If you have multiple lines, you need to be able to transfer and conference, right? And even if you have like a super work connected BlackBerry, it really doesn't cut it. So, yeah. so like what my company did, I mean, just because I've got all this on my desk right now, I'm looking at my Avaya IP phone. It's just, it's a real big telephone with a screen on it and everything. Just like a normal phone. Yeah. I mean, think about before VoIP, you really couldn't do that. You would have had to like buy a phone line and then they would have had to use like some crazy PBX shit right but now with voice or like call forwarding and all this like yeah. rig and roll with voip ip phones it's real easy you just you know you get a phone you use a sip it connects to your works pbx yep. over I the mean, internet right now i've got a phone on my desk and it's connected to my work office it's set to do not disturb because i'm like i don't but not it's, but it's any exactly calls. the same as if you had a phone on your desk in the office like literally it ring like if someone calls the support line it rings the same time as the other phones in like my office at work ring, and I can just answer the phone conference. I have my three phone lines in it. It's encrypted, VPN, and all that. It just works. So, being at home is no different than being in the office in terms of dealing with the, the phone. The thing is, a lot of companies, you know, they have VoIP now. It's, I mean, the last two places I've worked have had VoIP. You know, one place switched to it, the other place had it when I got there. Yep. Some people like they either outsource it to someone else or they set it up poorly. And it's just, a lot of people don't have it set up right. And it's always problematic or tricky or their network is screwy. So like VoIP works fine in the office, but you take it home and oh, it's a big mess. Now, and the answer to that is uh, straight up is either be willing to pay the exorbitant amount of money to have an outside firm that's competent do it. Or have smart people. <laughs> or be willing to invest in the people you have to train them to manage it internally. Or hire someone who knows how to set up an asterisk But that's still, that's still an investment. The idea yeah. is that either pay what it costs or pay what it costs to invest in local talent to do it. Mm -hmm. Don't try to cheapskate around it or it's going to suck. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, even today when the Internet's taken over and phones are sort of going down... Really, pretty much almost any office, you know, phones are like absolutely necessary and mission critical no matter what. And you really, you know, if your phone, the more your phones can do for you, you know, the, the awesomer your business is. You know, if you don't need to like use some weird service to do a conference and if you don't need to, you know, if you, if you have trouble like doing transfers or stuff like that. That's really going to hurt your business in the long run. Just that constant daily frustrations and you know, the money you pay for a phone system that works perfectly and has all these features really helps you. And people being able to work from home and have a phone that works exactly the same as the one on their desk perfectly. Yep. Not even just for telecommuting, huge. but imagine like there's a crazy blizzard. Well, all right, if I can't get into work, I'm screwed. Or I can just work from home because I've yeah, got I mean, how many people, right? I mean, people at my work do this. They'll be like, yeah, I'm working from home today. There's a crazy, the tra transit screwed up or yeah, I got to work from home today, but they don't really work from home. Work from home means don't take, don't lose a day of, you know, personal day or vacation day, but stay home. That's yep. what it means. Now the other, the other but key with though, a phone, you can stop people from doing that. You call them up. Also on my desk right here is the work laptop. And I feel like you can do it on your home computer. You just VPNs and all that, but Really, the best way, if you're a company and you want people to telecommute, buy them laptops and give them to them and tell them to take them home. Because well, because, I mean, that's that's a huge problem is that if you let people VPN with their own equipment, right? I mean, it works. It can be done. But it's such an extra chore for the IT people because, A, you have to support these people installing this crap and configuring it on their own machines. You have no idea what their machines are. And, two... You got this whole security risk of all these, you know, who knows what machines getting on your network. You don't want that shit on there. Yep. I mean, I have the ability. I use my laptop and my work laptop. Like, both of them are allowed to get into the corporate network because they know I'm not an idiot. Yep. And you do it yourself. They don't have to help you do it. You yeah, just do I, just, it. I installed the Cisco VPN client and right, I just right. connect in. But, it, like, you know, someone else, you can't just let them bring. But even that, like, I'll give you an example. Using my laptop, like, I can, like, if I'm, like out skiing or something, I have my laptop with me, and there's, like, an emergency, and they need me, like, they BlackBerry me, I can take my laptop and the Verizon card, and I can use, like, the Outlook web access to check my email, and I can, like, I can putty and X-Win and get into the stuff I need to get into, but the work laptop has just Outlook installed on it, and it's already on the domain at work. Like, I can just authenticate like normal, and I can just, like... It's exactly the same as sitting at your desk at work. Yeah, and the thing is, it's not a portable, like, it's not a fancy laptop like my laptop. I don't carry this work laptop around. Like, I don't carry it in my bag. It's a big, like, giant, powerful laptop. 
but I leave it on my desk at home. So yeah, the I- only reason it really needs to be a laptop is so that you can carry it home and then carry it back to work. They can't like give you a desktop to carry yep. home and right. Like when I travel for business, I bring my laptop on the plane and I put my work laptop in the luggage because I'm going to turn the work laptop on in the hotel room. I'm not going to use it like on the go. Yeah, the battery exactly. on the thing only lasts like two hours. It's like the mid-range Dell yeah, it's laptop. Not, it's not you know, giving someone a laptop because you want it to be portable and they should carry it everywhere with them. You're giving it to them because a laptop is able to be carried home and then, you know, it's one thing, you know, it's a lot less chance. It's some, you know, no one has to hook anything up. It's a lot easier to support. It's a lot easier to have them give it back to you if they quit or something. Yeah, and I mean, support, like, Imagine trying to support me if, like, I have a problem connecting with my laptop. There'd be a million things. I'm admin. I could have done whatever I wanted. I could have installed a stupid firewall, whatever. The work laptop, especially if you use, like, enterprise, or not even enterprise, but just, like, desktop management software, you can push the updates and manage the box remotely. You know, group policy, active directory, all that stuff. Plus, you buy a bunch of uniform laptops, right? You know they all have the exact same Yeah, and if someone's laptop breaks... You just ship them a new one, you know, like same day and tell them to mail the old one back and just, you know, image it. Yeah, if it's a desktop and a monitor and a mouse and a keyboard, forget about it. It's way too much. I guess just the moral is don't underestimate the benefit of having a dedicated separate work laptop. Or if you're like a consultant or like you work from home for a living, have a separate work computer. Even if you own both, like having the separate computer and the separate monitor goes like just as someone who works from home a lot. It goes a long way toward enforcing the discipline of work is work time, play is play time. Like, I get a lot more I mean, at the very least, you know, whether you're using Linux or Windows, you can have separate accounts to log into. That, you know, you log in to the work account, you know, and and then your, you know, the work user on your machine has totally different stuff from your regular user. And therefore, you know, you can't be like going to click on like there won't be a, an icon for Steam there. You know, this is the work account. It has an icon for the VPN and the whatever, whatever, you know, the other your work shit, your out your uh, Excels and your whatever you're using. I don't know. Office Thing is, people. Yeah. Yeah. Plus all the work software. I mean, I'm not going to own a copy of Visio. I, I would never buy Visio, but I need Visio for work. I need it a lot. And you know what? Because I have the work laptop. I've got Visio. Yeah, it's managing and I've got like licenses. Adobe, and I've got Distiller, and I've got all those things I need. You know, managing licenses, right? You're a company. You bought 100 copies of Microsoft Office, or you have a, you know, whatever. You can't, you know, let's say someone, you know, wants to work from home on their own computer. You can't just give them Microsoft Office. What if they didn't buy it? Now you got you got some trouble. They don't even have Outlook, right? So you get, you, you get, it's pretty, it's a lot of license trouble to get them a copy of Office to install on their machine legitimately and track those licenses, right? But the work laptop allows you to manage your licenses, you know, much more easily than uh, letting people telecommute with their own hardware. So... I think that's enough for now. I think that's a good overview of our feelings on this. Uh, I feel like we could do a show on disaster recovery at some point in the future. Uh, I feel like we could do a show on, like, the actual tech of telecommuting or, like, the actual societal things about telecommuting. Have you ever done a show on just, like, VPNs? I don't know. period? If we haven't, we should next because that's an easy topic that uh, a lot of people would do well to understand because... VPNs. Because you can talk about VPNs not only connecting to work, but connecting to your house also. Or even things that serve similar purposes. Like the humble SSH tunnel has like sol- like that solves more problems than you can possibly imagine. Oh, unless, yeah. unless you're someone like us who uses them all the time. I know, right? Like every problem I have, it's like, well, I'll just SSH tunnel it and then it's fine. Well, you think about that, right? It's like that's basically saying the problem doesn't exist because I know the solution. Yes, but, <laughs> but at the same time, if you don't know that is the solution, firewalls be tricky to set up. <laughs> yeah. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com or you can send audio feedback via Odeo 
Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.